Just say hi for Snapchat. <laughs> Great. Um, so how many people here already felt their phone vibrating in their pocket, picked it out, and there was actually nothing? Raise your hands. OK. Just look around you and realize that about 9 out of 10 people here actually experience something called phantom vibrations, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, right? Because it means that you got so conditioned by your smartphone that you're now imagining things that don't exist. We actually have a word for that. It's called a hallucination. So what I'd like to talk about today is how we can actually use artificial intelligence to get rid of all of that noise, and all of that complexity and oppression technology is bringing today. Because let's face it, if we have already an issue today with a couple of devices each, try to imagine what's going to happen in 10 years when we have hundreds of billions of connected devices around us. The amount of complexity we're going to have to manage as a human is going to increase exponentially. Fortunately, you know, there is something we can do about it. And this is very simply use artificial intelligence. Why? Because if a human alone cannot handle so much complexity, then why not create an assistant to whom you could delegate all of those things? An assistant that would know so many things about your life that it could answer any question you have, do anything you want it to do, and even directly handle all of your devices so that you don't even have to touch technology anymore. When you look at what's happening with artificial intelligence, it's taking a little bit of time to start, but today we're actually seeing this super fast exponential growth. And if anybody here felt recently that something scary was happening, all of those AIs beating champions at games, it's actually nothing to do with new algorithms. It has mostly to do with two exponentially compounding effects. We have enormous amounts of data accessible for the first time to teach those machines to do things, and we have infinite computing power. And the two together, essentially you know, help each other, and so this is why you have the super fast growth. What this means is that by 2025, we can probably expect the capabilities of those AI assistants to far outweigh any complexity that they will have to handle due to technology. And what this means is that your perception of technology in everyday life is going gonna, is gonna to disappear into the background. Just like electricity before, all of those connected devices will start becoming completely smart and integrated into your life to a point where you're just going to not have consciousness about it anymore. This is something people have been talking about since the 80s. It's called ubiquitous computing. It's this really amazing concept that you could somehow have hyper-connectivity, that everything around you is a connected device, everything is technology-enabled, but somehow, to you, it still feels unplugged. It feels real. And this is really important because when you consider that already today we're starting to be manipulated by our smartphones, then this is actually the difference between being a slave or actually being a human. So what do we mean by artificial intelligence? And in particular, how can you build an assistant that really understands your life? So I'm going to show you a little bit of the stuff we've been working on. Um, everything here is real data, uh, and it's actually quite, quite intensive. The first thing you want to know is where people are. Why? Because where you are is very highly correlated to the type of things you're doing. And if you want your assistant to be able to understand your life and help you, well, it needs to know everything you've been doing. In other words, it, need to, it needs to track your every move throughout the day. But location is very noisy, so your smartphone actually doesn't really know where you are. Each of those green dots is where your phone sees you. So even when you're home and you're actually not moving, your smartphone doesn't really know where you are. As a matter of fact, all of those places could be places where you are right now. So now what you want is to feed even more data to your assistant so they can start differentiating between those places and determining exactly where you are. You want to look at things like places you've been in the past, places which are very popular, the different times that you might go home. And what this tells you right now is that you're currently in a residence. You still don't know if you're home or you know, at your friend's uh, house nearby. Turns out in this specific case, what was really interesting was looking at the emails of that person because he was referring to one of those places and invitations he was sending to other people. 
And so therefore, you know, it has to be significant. You don't randomly talk about places. You don't send an invitation to people to go to like someone else's house. So you see how by combining those different elements, you're able to start getting more and more intelligence and more and more understanding about someone's life. Next, you want to be able to determine where people are actually no longer in the same spot, but moving to somewhere else. So here, you, know, you want to know if you're taking the metro, if you're biking, if you're walking, cycling, because those habits are also something that you need to take into account. If you like taking the car to go to work, you want your assistant to automatically you know, prepare the journey for you. If you like taking a taxi, you want your assistant to automatically book the taxi when you get out of your house. Next, you go to the office. Actually, no. Next, you go into the subway, which is very common for everybody here in Paris. But then, you know, you cannot really track people underground because you don't have any signal. It turns out you can still do that using the barometer of the phone. So the barometer measures the pressure uh, from your, uh, around you. And it turns out that when a train accelerates in a tunnel, that creates a physical effect that creates a peak in pressure variance. And so by looking at the time between those peaks, you're able to measure very accurately which station you've been going through without having to use the actual GPS and things like that, which is quite amazing when you think about it. But I also want you to think about something. Next time someone asks you to access the barometer of your phone, they might actually be asking you to give access to your location. And this is something quite amazing with data in general, is that you can transform it and do things with it that was not designed for in the beginning. Next, you go to the office, same problem. You don't know where you are. This time, you want to be looking at a calendar and things like that. But then you go and meet a friend for coffee. Um, turns out, in this specific case, it was a text message that really helped you understand what was going on. So you need to also be able to understand human language and natural language to extract places and events you're talking about. This is essentially a very simple way of looking at it. You could imagine this as a kind of timeline of activity you've been doing and the context in which these things occurred, which is a very simple way of representing information, but it's also a very machine-like way of looking at your life, right? There's a very nicely structured sequence of data. As it turns out, though, the human brain doesn't really store information that way. You know, you don't have a database like you would have in an Excel spreadsheet. Instead, what you have are a bunch of different pieces of information scattered all over the place, and you're creating links between those concepts based on how they relate to each other. And so, for example, if I tell you to come to my house tomorrow, the way you retrieve this information is that first you're thinking about me because I'm just in front of you, and then from me you're navigating to the concept of my house, and then to the con from the concept of my house to the address of my house. And this is a very, very effective way of representing knowledge and information. It's something that's actually called a knowledge graph. So the first thing you want to do when you want to build an intelligent assistant is you want to replicate this structure into the assistant's brain. So you want to represent all this information you're gathering and aggregating into this knowledge graph. This is great if you're looking at understanding things, but it doesn't really help do things because information itself is not actionable. What you want is to start plugging this information into very specific service providers, apps, and devices. For example, if you have a meeting, you want to know that you, know, you can look it up in Google Maps. If you have a restaurant, you want to look it up in OpenTable, La Fourchette, whatever. If you go to the office, you want to be able to just directly book an Uber to go to the office. And so this is one thing we've been working on recently. We've been really focusing on building the first layer of this assistant that would enable it to very simply access every single piece of data about your life, and from there, directly offer you to launch apps on your smartphone so that you don't have to even remember what you can do, where the data is located, which apps you can use for it. This is something that's extremely complicated, but is also necessary for the future of mobile, because the complexity of handling so many apps on your smartphone is just impossible today. So this brings me to one of the most important things that I feel people are not understanding about artificial intelligence. The whole point of those assistants is to know everything about your life. If you looked at the example before, you know where that person lives. You know what that person does. You know everything about that person. You have access to every one of their email or their text messages. And so the question of privacy is an enormous issue that hasn't been addressed so far. Just think about it for a second. Imagine if you had a physical, real person assistant. You know, she, he's helping you do things in your everyday work. Imagine if that person 
every single email you send it, send them, every single thing you ask them, they would send it to another company. How would you feel about your personal assistant going and giving a big company access to every single piece of data you trust them with? It wouldn't sound right. So why would you actually accept that from an artificial assistant that has even more access to your data? It doesn't make sense. So that's why a very important thing here is the concept of privacy by design. You need to build this assistant to handle your data in a way that guarantees nobody can access it and nobody can see it but you. It's your life, it's your data. If anybody tells you otherwise, they're probably doing something super shady in the background. So do not trust them. Everything I showed you so far, we can make it run directly on your smartphone. This is enormously complicated. I don't want to get into the details of this, but it's doable. This means that nothing has to happen in the cloud. As a company, I never need to see your data, and still I can provide an assistant which is much more intelligent than anything else that you could find today. So next time you're using an assistant, just think about that. It also creates a lot of trust. We've noticed from people doing a study that they actually do want to give you access to their data when they know that you're actually doing something right with it. This is something most people would dream about, but they can't because they don't have the privacy angle. Now, what's the next thing you want to be able to do? It's a great thing to have all of this data centralized somewhere, but you know, the kind of purpose of an assistant is that you can ask him to do something. right? You can ask him to book an Uber to go to an address. So this is fairly simple for a machine to comprehend. You, know, you can understand that booking is the action, Uber is a provider, 18 Rue Saint-Marc is the address, boom, done. This is 100% about you know, parsing the syntax of the sentence, because the sentence is self-contained. There is nothing ambiguous in the sentence. Every piece of information you need to access is contained within the sentence itself. But it turns out, most of the time, you don't really know exactly what you're asking. right? You might know roughly that you know, it's in this area, and maybe you want to go to someone's birthday party, but you certainly don't know the address. This is not something you would remember. And most assistants today would basically fail. They would figure out that you want an Uber, but then they couldn't find an address, and so they would return some awkward answer saying, hey, I'm sorry, I don't really understand what you meant, and at that point, you're probably giving up, right? But really, if you give it access to every single piece of data about your life, if it has this underlying knowledge graph, which represents information like you would, you're able to determine that Rand is a contact, that there is a birthday party and the events which are related to that person, and that because you need an address, you can extract it from the event and send it to Boogie Uber. Without this underlying knowledge graph, which really represents the memory layer of your artificial assistant, it would be impossible to understand simple things that a human could very easily uh, do for you. You can also go further, right? You can start thinking about how this can be integrated with other devices you're using. If you want to turn off the lights, if your assistant has access to everything, it knows you're currently at home. It knows that the lights nearby are turned on, and so this is what it actually wants to turn off. This is particularly important because as soon as your assistant is not capable of managing devices for you, it can also start learning how you use them. It can start learning at which time you come home to make sure that you're not heating your house for nothing. It can make sure, it can learn that when you watch a movie, you like the lights at a certain level. It can learn that when you have a dinner party with friends, you like this type of music. And it can start automating all of that. And so you see, when we talk about making technology disappear into the background, it has to go through this phase of teaching your assistant the kind of things you want it to do so that it never, you never have to touch devices anymore. There is one big issue, though, which is that to be able to do things outside of one single device, so if you're no longer talking about a smartphone but about all of those connected devices around you, well, how do you still guarantee privacy? Because by definition, it's no longer in one device, so you need to do things in the cloud. It turns out that there is a new type of cryptography that is coming up, that is happening right now. So this is incredible. Honestly, like, I've been coding since I'm 10 years old, and I haven't been excited by a new technology as much as this one in a very, very long time. So bear with me for a second. This is called homomorphic encryption. It sounds extremely complicated, because it is, but conceptually, it's very simple. The idea is that you can directly run your algorithms on the encrypted data. So let's say you take that location on your smartphone. Instead of sending the actual location to the server, what you do is that you encrypt the location, send it to the cloud, so the cloud doesn't have the key. It has no way of knowing where you are. It just receives some random number. But the way you encrypted it actually preserves some mathematical property. So you can do additions, multiplications, 
which means that you can actually run any kind of complicated artificial intelligence algorithms on the encrypted data itself. You produce a result that you still do not understand. You do not have the key. This is like operating inside a black box. You don't know what you're touching here. Send it back to the smartphone, which can then decrypt it and interpret the results. This is such a groundbreaking type of technology that it means that every single computation, every single service that exists today on this planet could potentially be done without ever needing you to send your data to the provider. Every company could be profitable, offer services which are very data intensive without any risk to your privacy. And so all this is really important, you see, because ever since I was a kid, everybody has been promising a future that kind of looks like a sci-fi movie, something very technologically oppressive, something with tall metal buildings everywhere, huge advertising over the place, and police looking at you and at every move. You know, a society essentially where you get to a point of auto-censorship that is so extreme that everybody becomes exactly the same person. But when you talk to people, when you just talk to people, what you realize is that what they want is really something like that, right? Everybody wants to be on a beach, you know? People like peacefulness. They like disconnecting. They don't like technology. Technology is only meant for one purpose, is to help people have a better life. And so what I believe very strongly today is that if we want to live in a future where artificial intelligence can get us rid of technology, we're going to need to do it in a way that also guarantees our privacy. Because the difference between living in a world where we're basically slaves to that technology and those artificial intelligences and a world where we have the freedom to do anything we care about is going to be our ability to do this. Thank you.